Pro. I'm joined today by Eric Franchi and our guest, Lara O'Reilly, the senior correspondent from Insider. Lara, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me, finally. We've run the circle of every uh, senior reporter that covers ad tech, but we forgot the... Uh, we forgot you for some reason. I don't know. I, there's no good excuse given your uh, extensive background in this space. Uh, maybe it's it's a distance thing. I'm London <laughs> based for for people who don't know I'm in the UK. You want to run us through all the places that you've been covering ad techs? Or you were at the Wall Street Journal. You were were you an ad exchanger? I was not. No, um, I started out at Marketing Week, the uh, the UK trade publication that covers marketing weekly, as you'd guess. It used to be a magazine. Um, then I went to Business Insider the first time around when it was still known as Business Insider. Yeah, then the Wall Street Journal did a brief stint at Yahoo Finance, not doing ad tech, and then couldn't keep myself away, came back and um, reported again on ad tech. And... So you used to be known as just, you know, a senior ad tech reporter, but now you're known as Joe Zawatsky's stalker. <laughs> yeah, it was, um, yeah, I got promoted. <laughs> No, what I'm referring to, probably everyone knows, is that Lara has, over the past, uh, I don't know, six months, just reported the hell out of Media Math, multiple articles about uh, before it went bankrupt. I want to just tee that up and talk about it. So how much time have you been spending covering this? How have you found all this info? What have you found? Talk Media Math for a while. I mean, like, the the long answer is kind of like, you know, nine years, really. I, I joined BI the first time around, the first, first rodeo in... 2014 and I knew nothing about ad tech and I was an editor as well as a writer then and the first story I edited was about Media Math and I was trying to wrap my brain I think Media Math was one of the first kind of ad tech companies I held a meeting with when the the US team came to London so I'm not just being facetious when I say it but it's kind of been like nine years in in the making and that's how I've, I've got to know the company and the people in it and around it so well. What was that first article about do you remember? So this was one of our reporters had been asking around, like, who is the star company in, in ad tech that everybody should pay attention to? And one answer kept coming up, and it was Media Math. Is Media Math the best story in ad tech? Like the, the rise, fall, hubris, et cetera? Are you going to make a book out of this, a movie? What can I say? No, not really. It's not really the best, is it? I, I, th- I feel like, you know, it's, it's a sad story, someone described it as a kind of Shakespearean tragedy. That said, it's got all the elements, the highs, the lows, the, you know, the, there's lots of opinions on who the the victors are and who the villains are. So I don't know. Who do you think should play Joe? That was, I was just racking my brain about who would play <laughs> Joe. <laughs> uh, readers, please, uh, uh, or listeners, please uh, chime in on social media about who would be the correct actor to, to play Joe. <laughs> Uh, you have to start with the hair, right? You have to start with the hair. Oh, well, you can make the hair up. I think you need some height too. This is, but what is the story? So, Larry, if you were if we we're at a cocktail party and and I was uh, and I wasn't in ad tech, it's hard to believe. Uh, and I was like, you know, what are you working on? What's the interesting story? How would you explain media math to someone who is just interested in the salacious details and not particularly sure. in our industry? And just like before I do, just to kind of like a look behind the curtain. So every time I write about Media Math, I get a bunch, well, at least recently, given what's what's happened in the bankruptcy, I get a bunch of messages saying, you know, thank you for taking the time to t- tell the story and um, for going in, you know, taking the lengths to to get all the accuracy and the detail. And, and then for kind of every five of them, I get another one saying I got it wrong or I shouldn't have written it at all. <laughs> One person accused me of spitting on the company's grave when I wrote the story about Media Mass Final Days, which um, is an opinion, I guess. Hello, if you're listening, by the way. Um, <laughs> so I, I just like they're, they're like emotions are running high, obviously, because, um, you know, there's a lot of people involved and there's a lot of love for the company and the people and, you know, people are owed money. There's, you know, and, and it's also kind of a very kind of complicated story, as I said, where, um, it's, I mean, and it's still, it's it's not finished, by the way. But anyway, to explain it, you know, it's a it's a very long story about kind of one of the the OGs of ad tech, and you know, I, I say it was a pioneer, kind of and ahead of its time in in so many areas. And so, Media Math claims, although this is also disputed, um, so I'm just going to continue girding my inbox for everyone saying that I'm wrong. But the, you know, it was a pioneer. It, it invented the first demand sign platform, according to Media Math, and they assembled this kind of a team of 
ad tech royalty who's gone on to work for big companies like Google and Amazon or started successful startups of their own. And, you know, they were really ahead of their time in terms of kind of supply chain transparency and predicting that marketers would want to own more programmatic in-house. And that was kind of the central vision, which in some ways is playing out now a little if you look at things like retail media, although Medium F didn't really have a play there, but also in other respects, perhaps that was considered one element of its downfall that Medium F kind of eschewed the the agencies and focused too much on the on the marketers and by which point the trade desk came in and ate its lunch because it focused very keenly on just just the agencies. So yeah, Medium F grew and grew and it had kind of, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in ad spend passing through its system and you know, 700 employees at one point and a, a cool office at Four World Trade Center. And it had all these opportunities to sell to companies like IBM and Singtel and Bain, but kind of kept holding on for, you know, it was never quite right. It was never quite the right, you know, deal size, right time, right owner. So I'm telling this in a very long yeah. way, but as, essentially, you know, it, it you know, they, they, they went with a, a private equity firm where essentially probably didn't get as much protection as they should have done on if things kind of went to the downside, which they did through COVID. Said she had a, a bit of a straight racket as far as their credit agreement was concerned with Goldman Sachs. Um, you know, a new management team's brought in. They thought they had two years to turn it around. The PE owner calls out to the blue and says, actually, no, you've got three months to, you know, find some more money or sell the company because we're not giving you any more. They almost got there um, with Media Games Invest. They pulled out last minute. And then they just tried everything, but ultimately ran out of time and money. And now the, the company is no more and, and being sold for parts. In a yeah, time. I have a lot of follow-up questions. One of them is, uh, you said the story's not over yet. What do you, what do you mean by that? There's going to be a, a bankruptcy auction for its assets. So someone could come along and try to purchase the whole thing, or it could, you know, it could be sold for parts. So maybe somebody comes and buys the ad server component, someone... I don't know, right? Uh, that, that that kind of thing. So that there could be a um, like a second act of of Media Math. Well, it seems really challenging to restart a stopped plane in midair like that. It, they haven't been bidding for weeks, and to be able to get the customers back and get them using it, that just seems really challenging to me. Yeah, I I, I agree. I mean, a, a lot of a company is its its people and its expertise and its clients and presumably it, it costs a lot of money to switch DSPs and some clients will have been forced to do that already so right. are they going to come back but there are also other things you might be able to do with the tech like integrate it into you know, a company that doesn't have you know, demand side technology at the moment and perhaps you know might find a use for it. So you mentioned the uh, the question of selling to agencies versus marketers. And a lot of people say that was the big mistake that caused a lot of other problems. Other people say the big problem was bad financing or too much financing or whatever, however you want to say it. And then when I posted on Twitter some of these thoughts, people chimed in that they missed video. That was actually their biggest mistake. Or they spent too much time on direct-to-consumer, which turned out to be a kind of a bad sector. Is there, is there one thing that sticks out for you as the, as the fatal flaw? Honestly, no, and that would have made it a lot easier, a story to write. I think it was a, just a combination of, yeah, maybe picking the wrong swim lane on certain things, bad luck, bad timing, investors with different incentives or thoughts about how the, where the company could go, maybe too much restructuring and, you know, changes of people's roles, things like that, or, or hopping from, you know, new thing to new thing. You know, COVID really didn't help. And I think, you know, the Harvard Business School case study, and I think a lot of people have kind of written this in their post-mortems, is it just kind of highlights the the kind of shaky dynamics of ad tech and the reliance of so many companies on credit in order to maintain a healthy working capital because we've all just, well, we, you guys, you idiots, have all come to accept, <laughs> have all come to accept that everybody just pays late and that's fine and sequential liability is is just a thing that um we all put up with and and hope doesn't happen and hope we're not the ones holding the bag but it's no coincidence that joe's now working on a fintech startup that looks to solve for all these kind of exact issues yeah the, the, i was going to bring that up um and eric you're an investor in that as well right 
Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, Eric's notably silent throughout this entire segment. <laughs> Joe's, Joe's sitting next to Eric right now. <laughs> yeah, he's kidding. I wanted to say. Oh, the bat. Sus Pavelio at the Matza say Eric has no comment. You, know, you you said something funny just now, which is like, you idiots in ad tech. Do you, do you feel that way a lot? Uh, I, I mean, not just ad tech. I mean, advertising, I think, in general is just like the most ridiculous industry, which is why it's so fun to write about. Like, there's, you know, there's, I'm, I'm, I'm being facetious, but of course there is, there is lots of, um, you know, genius and creativity, but there's also just a lot of like r- ridiculous ways things are done just because that's the way they've always been done. You know, like TV upfronts and can and just stupid things like that. How much uh, do you um, focus on the ridiculousness versus the innovation and creativity and, and genius from a, from the perspective of, <laughs> of, of the, from the perspective of what resonates uh, with the insider audience, which is the goal, right? Um, and yeah. you've got you've got I- interesting insight and in, in analytics. Like, what do people? It's obvious what the answer is, given the subject matter you know, we, we've been talking about. But like, what do people like to read? Look, we're not we're not trade press. Although what we do is quite similar in that we have, you know, there's not not many mainstream business publications that have such a keen focus on say ad tech for instance um because or, or like kind of the, the niches of of advertising perhaps they have teams that cover advertising but it's usually more of a kind of a broader kind of 30,000 feet look at things well not always but um i guess the answer is is you know the the stories that people like are the ones that are i mean they are enjoyable to read, have an obvious tension and protagonist and, you know, something you learn from, something that surprises you, something that you can, you feel compelled to share. And often that isn't a feature update from an ad tech company. Uh, as a former CEO of an ad tech company, um, the last thing anyone in, in marketing or press wants to hear is like, we have a new feature out, you should write about us, no one cares. That being said, we do things like we celebrate the ad tech companies VCs are most excited about. In fact, I participated in that the one of those that we just put out a month ago. Can I just tell you how much hell I got for that? Why? What was the hell? <laughs> so we're an investor in a lot of companies. You know, uh, I couldn't overload Lara's inbox with all of them, right? So it's, you know, A, thinking through, you know, sort of like uh, given the criteria that Laura asked for, who's the appropriate uh, companies to nominate. But then number two, I don't know if it was well understood what the criteria was. Mm-hmm. So companies that had not raised in the past 12 to 18 months, you know, sort of like, you know, the, the couple of criteria that you gave me, Laura, to, to sort of like w- w- winnow it down, people that were not necessarily fits for the for for the list, we're um we're we're had a lot of questions, like picking between your favorite children. Yeah, everyone thinks that their VC uh, loves them, or, unless they really hate them. <laughs> I I get that. It's um I don't know. It's yeah, but the lists are great. Um, nice things. But yeah, so we do, and we celebrate the people, and you know, we've got a, a innovative CMO list coming out soon, and that kind of thing, and we do cover. Yeah, particularly when there are new trends and technologies like AI and retail media, um, we we do a spotlight on those. But I guess the, the thing about us is it is it's more driven by, you know, us and and the our editorial instincts and what our readers are showing us they they're interested in, rather than the companies telling us that they have a product update and it comes out on this day or that kind of thing. And as a reporter who covers this area, you you must see some really strange things. I mean. You know, the ad tech community tends to get pretty pissed at the pubs, I'd imagine. And the, the conferences you have to go to are uh, often, you know, a little bit out there, is uh, what I would say. Care to comment on that? I, I mean, sure. Um, you know, there's, um, I think also because it's it's a very close community, right? And I, and I imagine if you cover, I don't know, another community where, you know, there's a small kind of subsets of people who have kind of built companies, sold them, you know, reinvested in other companies. I, I imagine it, it's similar in you know, other areas. I'm, I'm racking my brains to think about one, I don't know, cannabis tech or something. Like there's a community of people who all kind of know each other and have their own politics between them. So I think that adds like a, a little bit more 
Yeah, I don't know. Spice I spice to the mix sometimes. <laughs> I find Mar- Martech people are boring. That's my general. <laughs> and, and so you're based in London, um, and London has sort of its own distinct ad tech scene that's like uh, uh, very agency centric, and uh, they tend to do a lot of breakfast. A lot of uh, it's all breakfast uh, in the U.S. No, 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 breakfast meetings. <laughs> I was going to say it all happens at the the takers, the Guinness the bar in uh, in Soho. Is the London ad tech scene still kind of happening, or um, is uh, Brexit affecting it? Is there, is it something you cover? I don't cover it as a phenomenon, but I just speak, obviously, just speak to a lot of people in the industry, and yeah, it's it's where I live, so I'm closest to those. Um, I say closest to those people that make it sound like I'm like pledging allegiances, but is Brexit affecting it? I mean, probably. With, there's a cost of living price crisis and inflation and interest rates are up. Like that, I'm sure that adds to things, and it makes it harder to recruit over here, and wages are, are much lower. So I'm sure, you know, I, I'm sure it it kind of adds to it. It's certainly been a just broadly has has had an impact, I think, on the the ad industry kind of writ large. Here. Yeah, I think ITV just announced this week that they are having re- significant weakness in their television business. Um, that's not ad tech per se, but it's a uh, it's a similar. Yeah, it's like the biggest self sabotage I think a, a country has has done in my lifetime that I can think of. Yeah, uh, I agree. Um, so this week was uh, earnings week, so we have a lot of news. So we're going to switch uh, and start talking about the news of the week um, after a uh, quick break. All right, we're back. Big news in earnings. Um, so Google up had a big earnings beat um, with YouTube up 4% after several quarters of it being flat or down. Me and my ex-double-click friends, I like to call this the Neil Mohan magic. And I think he's probably a man on a mission to uh, to make that grow again. Uh, and then also uh, Meta hat was up 11% after quite a bit of stagnation on their revenue growth. Is this kind of a broad bellwether uh, for advertising being back, or is it? Or are these two companies kind of special? Maybe, Eric, you want to talk about your thoughts about this? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think uh, I'm hopeful that this is a trend, um, number one, right? Because these are you know the, the, the largest companies out there, and I think they do set the tone for the market. Um, Snap was down, um, but eBay was up. So it's like you know, I think you can probably find uh, if if one, one chooses, you know, stories to to support any any narrative. But you know, Google was up overall, Meta was up significantly overall, albeit off a, a reduced base, and they had good guidance for Q3, and that sort of maps to what I'm hearing in the market, where it's like, okay, thank God, first half is over, we're in Q3, the rest of the year, is, you know, seems to be seems to be pretty good. So I think a I think it supports that you know it could be a, a positive uh, first uh, second half of the year. Two, uh, Brian Weezer, friend of the pod, uh, had in his note that there were a couple of large marketers that noted in their own earnings that they're uh, investing more heavily uh, in the second half um, in marketing and advertising. Specifically, it was Coca Cola, Denone, and Wreck It Ben Kaiser. Um, so I think that's uh, number two. And then number three, I think this tailwind of AI is is real. They're all talking about it because they all have to talk about it, and they're all right. saying the, the the same thing. But again, from what I'm seeing and hearing, and how this is mapped to products, like we're as you can imagine, ad tech advertising is you know the first area of I think obvious uh, benefits with AI around creative and targeting and algos, so on and so forth. And I think with a lot of these sort of network like products, it's it's um, it's driving a lot of growth, and it will continue to. Lara, anything you're hearing? Um, this is well timed because um, literally 27 minutes ago, I published a story uh, with the headline: "The advertising winter may finally be starting to thaw," which um, oh, essentially yeah, covers. Uh, yes, please do. Please, please click and subscribe and say that you subscribe specifically because of this article. Um, so yeah, I, I think Meta and Alphabet are quite good bellwethers, and as as Eric pointed out, like a lot of the big advertising spenders are all saying that they want to increase I see their, read your article. I'm, I'm looking at it right now. And it's okay. <laughs> Sorry, it's like I, thunder, but I, I, mean, I did not. No, it's fine. I, I mean, to, in, in all honesty, I, I also quote Brian in this because um, he was um, some of the inspiration for it. But 
And uh, I also spoke to the um, the ad research firm. I don't know how to pronounce it. Walk, walk, W A R C, who said that they're going to um, basically increase their um, they're going to increase their uh, forecast next month for global ad spend for 2023. Um, basically, in light of all of this, one thing I will say though is like it not not everywhere is predicting a, an uplift in marketing outlay, like. It's kind of quite funny that the the biggest beneficiaries of this advertising rebound, uh, rebound, sorry, the tech companies like Meta and Microsoft are all having their years of efficiencies and lowering their ad- advertising spend. So, um, right. yeah, th- thanks, guys. But so, but there, there are like, it, it, there's more kind of positive signs, I think, than negative. And something that, that Brian kind of pointed out as well is that Marketers have been apprehensive for so long because everyone keeps saying there's going to be a recession in the US that still hasn't come to pass. And all that happens is because the economists don't want to be wrong. They just keep pushing out their forecasts and saying, oh, it it will happen a bit later than we thought. So it just means this apprehension just becomes prolonged and nobody wants to make long-term investment decisions. So everything's, which is kind of great for digital advertising, not so great if you're selling uh, TV or, or, you know, you want to get someone on some big digital transformation project or something like that. The Fed uh, announced in the U.S. Uh, the guidance that they no longer expect, are forecasting a recession at all. Um, so that should accelerate spend. And 2024 is the political and Olympics year. So uh, we could be in for some pretty positive experience over the over the uh, forthcoming, you know, 18 months. I, I want to point out, though, the, the snap miss. Um, so... I'm unfortunately a Snap shareholder and have been for a long time, and they never cease to disappoint. Um, air earning season for them is always a disaster. Uh, it's like uh, one root canal after another. Um, and I think that Eric's, Eric Zuford, our contributor to Architecture, he covers this so well. And his, I'm going to just boil down his very broadly what he's saying, which is Meta took ATT, Apple's ATT seriously, and Snap didn't. Uh, and that's why where we're seeing divergence. We're now like I guess two years later after ATT first rolled out, uh, Meta had some hard quarters. They they had to tweak enormous amount of things about their giant advertising system, but then they did it uh, because they're known for quite good engineering and, and execution. And Snap did not take it that seriously. They have less scale, less AI, and as a result. They're continuing to disappoint where, you know, for both companies, the majority of their advertising is mobile. So uh, you should check out uh, Eric's essays on these subjects at mobiledevmemo.com. Speaking of media math, um, we now are starting to see some reverberation from the media math bankruptcy um, with some SSPs. Ad exchangers reporting that some SSPs are clawing back revenue from publishers. Um, while other SSPs, uh, notably, we mentioned Gum Gum a couple weeks ago, but now um, Index Exchange has come out and said they will not be clawing back from publishers. This is an interesting kind of nuance. And Larry, you had talked about uh, sequential liability. Um, how how do you think this plays out? Yeah, I, I don't know if this is coincidental or not, but it is quite interesting that the two public SSPs, Pubmatic and Magnite are the ones that are saying they're saying they're kind of unable to well, actually sorry, they're they're recouping the, the revenue paid to publishers from um the media math deals. I don't know if that's related or not. I'm just saying that is a kind of interesting thing to think about. Right. Um, so you think maybe it's because they're uh in the public eye that they would have to show a, a miss in earnings or something if they didn't do it? I guess so, yeah. And I mean the the likelihood of them being able to claw back, you know, a substantial amount from the um the bankruptcy proceedings. You know, I, I just I just we everyone's talking about pennies on the dollars, so I don't know. Maybe it's kind of take the hit now rather than say uh, or not, well, sorry, not take the hit now rather than, than kind of hold out and say, Well, we might be able to recoup this later on. I I, I don't know. I, I haven't particularly looked into it. I, I think just again, this just speaks to second order effects when there's um, a big catastrophic event like this. And I think it will also, given payment terms are 90, uh, yeah, so up to 180 days, I don't think we're going to see the full effect of the, the medium of bankruptcy and fallout for you know a, a few months to, to come at least. These are public companies. Um, and I think it needs to be considered that public companies just have certain restrictions 
that private companies uh, do not. I think that's thing one. Thing two is there's ways, likely ways that you know these SSPs can make uh, publishers whole um, and it not be connected to it or made them partly whole, whether it's you know, through all the other offerings that, that they have for, for those publishers. And then I think there's number three, the reality, um, and it's probably more Magnite than Pubmatic. These are important partners for publishers and they bring significant revenue, significant demand. And I don't think that it's to the point, at least right now, where publishers can turn off Magnite and Pubmatic. So I think it's a little bit, you know, this is just a, a road that they need to they need to plow through. On the other side, it probably gives BD people at some of these, you know, other SSPs uh, some good opportunity. On the other side, I think it probably puts Trade Desk in an interesting position with, you know, all of what they're doing around around Open Path. It's a weird one because they're big public companies. Yeah, Matt Barish is just taking meeting after meeting. He's bringing his little cute baby to the meetings, trying to close deals. As he should. It gives, it gives them a real window of opportunity. Matt is the person we mentioned the most on this podcast, but don't invite on. Uh, we'll have you on eventually, Matt. Uh, he's not Elon. He's not Elon, yeah. Uh, also, is noteworthy, uh, Google is not clawing back. But with that said, um, and we talked about this at the time, uh, Google's actual balance in the bankruptcy proceeding was kind of low. And that's basically because they're just vicious about uh, turning people off if you don't pay your bills. Um, you do not want to negotiate with Google's accounts receivable department. They they don't negotiate. They they it's really just a bot that collects your money or turns you off. Um, so um, you know that's a advantage of scale. I, I think if uh, other platforms were so aggressive with collections, they would get a lot less revenue. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, speaking of Pubmatic, uh, so Pubmatic put out a, a new product or they announced a new product called Convert which is a commerce media product. It sounds like it does everything. I'm sort of a little bit scratching my head as to what it is because it says uh, that it does sponsored listing ads, display ads, connected TV ads, on-site and off-site monetization, and it's for retailers. So this sounds exciting. Uh, I'd love to see a demo. I'd love to see what it is um, because it sounds like it's a lot of stuff. And this follows on Pubmatic um, announcing a couple of months ago its, its buy side product. Um, so it seems like they're doing a lot of product development and innovation trying to get out of the just being an SSP. It kind of sounds like uh, X, the everything app. Who knows <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what was it that Linda Recarino tweeted? I'm trying to find it, but like, you know, who, who knows what the possibilities will be? Well, are you very ever... big. Do you ever like look at some of the press releases coming your way and just and just like have to diagram the sentences and try to figure out like a beautiful mind style what they're talking about? <laughs> I, I, yes, although um, more often than not, I, I, I don't really get past the subject line. I just <laughs> archive or read. Yeah, read later. Eric, you cover retail media, commerce media a lot. Is this interesting? Is this a game changer? I have no idea. Um, I'm, uh, no, I'm not. I'm not trying to troll or be facetious or anything. Like PubMatic's a great company. Um, it says it does everything that a commerce media seller might might want. So um, yeah, I think it's it's cool conceptually. Leave it at that. I haven't seen a demo. To give right. um, PubMatic the, I guess the credit it deserves for this. Um, or well, credit, but. I also didn't know much about this, so I, I spoke with um, Kieran O'Kane of uh, Wirecourt before the show so I could cheat, and he gave me some crib notes. But basically, he said, is he a friend of the show, by the way? I don't know. Yeah, he's been on. In the past. Yeah, he's been on. Oh, yeah. good, good. Friend of the show, not just kind of Avtech adjacent. This show uh, doesn't have any enemies <laughs> that I know of. Yeah. <laughs> We're trying to make them as wait, quickly wait as possible. publish this episode. Um, but yeah, he, he thinks it's super smart because kind of product listings is the kind of best game in town for ad tech companies like Pubmatic because the real opportunity is aggregating the kind of mid to long tail of commerce media and, and retail media sites. So he thinks that mid to long tail is, is the big opportunity, especially when open RTB comes to retail media. Okay, that's interesting. I, I think that the SSPs have traditionally not spent, not had a big role here because the ads, that the product listing ads just are not standardized. So they aren't usually sold via RTB. And so I think that's what Karen's getting at a little bit, which is if you could sell them by RTB, that would be better. 
and uh, it's just a, it's a big opportunity retail media. So uh, they're throwing in their throwing in their hat. All right, more news. We have, we have a lot of news today. Uh, let's do France saying that Apple is anti-competitive. Um, so France has been investigating Apple for its ATT privacy program, and they announced that they are moving forward with some sort of uh, investigation about Apple being anti-competitive by basically uh, kneecapping everyone else's ad network while launching their own. This is interesting. Um, I mean, you know, European governments are finding all kinds of creative ways to uh, to harass American companies. This is a new one. Um, I think a lot of people feel this way that Apple has been uh, talking out of two sides of its mouth about this whole thing. It'd be pretty interesting to see what the outcome could be. I, can, I, I could kind of speculate, but I don't really have any real thoughts. Has anyone, uh, Lara, have you looked at this at all? Yeah, so this has been ongoing for for quite a while, actually. I think I covered the, the initial complaint when I was at DigiDay. So this has been going, I, I guess, ever since at t even before it rolled out. I, th- I think at this stage, Apple still has a, a chance to kind of respond before the regulator makes a final decision. So these things just take forever. But I mean, yeah, look, it is kind of no coincidence that ATT launches and then Apple's search business goes bananas. Um, that's kind of wild. Yeah. Um, even though they say the two are, are definitely 100% not connected, according to the professor who we paid to put out the white paper. <laughs> also, the way that they ask for permission to track you on their device is is so friendly for Apple and so horrible for everybody else. Um, hey, let, let us let us help you. Let us guide you across our. I'm not a conspiracy <laughs> theorist, but it always does seem like France does things that might benefit Critio at some point. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Critio is effectively the the champion, <laughs> local champion of ad tech in Europe, and it's always France that does things that are kind of that that you kind of scratch your head and wonder if uh, if there's some influence there. Funny that. Although I think the UK has a similar case doesn't it as the cma is, yeah was looking into something similar and I, I don't know who our ad tech champion is at this point right and the cma has established its authority to regulate the google sandbox which was kind of fascinating um yeah. because they came to an agreement uh you know a while back that any rollout of the sandbox was going to need cma approval any idea what the largest sign for uh a technology company um uh, France has ever levied and made to pay. There was that giant fine against Facebook, but I don't think that was France. Apple has fifty billion dollars of cash <laughs> and mar- and marketable securities, and I think uh, they're going to do what Apple's going to do. Yeah, if it's a fine, if the remedy is a fine, if the remedy is turn off your ad network in France, that's just maybe a little bit more aggressive. But France, they could do that too. Yeah, how, uh, how big is the, the the ad network in France? Yeah, right. The, if anyone knows the size of Apple's ad network in France, that's the most obscure ad tech question I could possibly imagine. So Roblox has an ad yes. network. Everyone has an ad network. Everything's an ad network. Uh, oh. So, <laughs> no? What do you mean, no? Go ahead. We read the description. I have thoughts. <laughs> um, so basically, this is uh, this is ads in Roblox games. So Roblox is a platform where independent publishers can create Roblox games and they monetize them. And this is effectively being able to show ads in other in these games that are either experiences, uh, like click in experiences, uh, or promotions for other games. Correct. Um, Eric Sufford has done so many great things to shed light on how you know this. This wave of first-party driven ad sellers and ad networks um, have exploded and created, created a lot of value. But the phrase, everything is an ad network, is now being used, I think, a little bit too widely. And on this one, I think, and again, I'm not a, Ro- a, Roblox, a Roblox expert, but it might not be the, the right term to be used. An ad network is when you have aggregation across multiple properties, multiple uh, areas, if all of the activity is happening on Roblox, its own media entity, right? So I think you know thematically, and and I understand you know where where Eric's going with everything is an ad network. It's really you know every scaled first party data player can build an ad offering, and I think you know this is less another ad network 
more another potential walled garden that we need to be taking seriously and has the benefit or the opportunity to be like really, really big, really scalable. So I think it's interesting, but, and again, I'm, I'm an ad network founder. I think there's nuance to this whole thing um, that uh, it just, it, it's, the, it's the reaction as soon as there's another uh, ad platform announcement that I don't know if it's you know necessarily the, the right phrasing, the right terminology. Sure. I, I get that. I mean, I think that from reading about the ad creatives, I think it's mostly click in to other games or experiences in the games as well. So uh, it's, this is a little bit different from what people have been working on. One interesting, like just to tie a lot of uh, bows together, you know, Anzu did that big fundraise um, a couple months ago. Um, they claim to serve ads into Roblox, and I think they're not allowed to. So I think Roblox is trying to trying to stamp out people who serve ads into Roblox games that are not Roblox. Um, I don't know if that's anti-competitive or against the rules or what, I don't know if that's a big part of Anzu's business, but I just want to kind of bring that up. That's an interesting little conflict there. I really think the future is, is for, for those who can do it, a lot of walled gardens. And then to Lara's point via here and earlier, you know, there's probably a mid to long tail that become, you know, part of bigger plays, bigger networks. Yep. I get that. Roblox also has, you know, very young audience, so it's, you have to be very careful with the data so that it doesn't, right. uh, it, le it does lend itself pretty well to a walled garden approach. Last topic, um, this just came out this morning, Wall Street Journal is reporting that a year in, Netflix is turning the dials a little bit on its ad program. Um, a couple of things in the, in the article, uh, first that they may be lowering the pricing, one of the noteworthy aspects of the deal they signed was that Microsoft guaranteed a very high uh, CPMs. I think it was reported to be $65 CPMs globally. So that was a guarantee. Right. And that's just crazy. <laughs> that's a crazy high number. Uh, even as, as great as the experience of seeing an ad on Netflix probably is for the advertiser, still a high number. So they're talking about lowering the price. And also there was some mention about bringing in other partners. Uh, so I don't know how that is playing out. Otherwise, most of the buzz around the Netflix ad program is that it's off to a good start and has been exciting for the company. Lara, is this something you've been looking into? Yeah, I kind of feel like we've we've seen this movie play out before when like, you know, platform, uh, you know, tech platform comes in big and bolstery with like, you know, insane CPMs. You get a couple of marquee brands that want to say they were first and, and they take up, take it up and then... You get back to like renewal time and there's no way they're going to pay those CPMs anymore and, and everyone negotiates and we all find ourselves in a kind of more um, yeah, comfortable place. I think the, yeah, this, this kind of the, the interesting aspects I think are going to be on the, the Microsoft side. I think it was, it was always kind of a given that that exclusive relationship was only temporary and the question was whether Netflix would build in-house, buy some ad tech itself, or maybe, you know, partner with other other technology companies to bring in more demand. I know that they posit in the answer call maybe the trade desk of free will, which would like both would kind of make sense. Maybe less so free will just because of Comcast, I don't know. But so yeah, yeah, as I say, the interesting thing for me is if Netflix just completely abandons Xander, maybe it does, maybe it maybe it's still would continue to work with them. But yeah, what does this kind of mean for Xander as it sits within kind of Microsoft advertising? Does that, you know, is is Xander kind of long for this world, at least as a kind of standalone brand? There's been a lot of, you know, change and restructuring there. Still a massive business, still has a massive international business. I'm not saying like it goes away, but I'm just wondering um, what that kind of signifies about that. Well, there there was news last week. We didn't cover it on the pod just for time, but uh, Mike Welch, the former GM of Xander, left, um, and he uh, joined Captify, uh, which is a performance, uh, I want to call him an ad network, I'm not sure what else to call him, as CEO. So Captify got a new CEO with a you know, very seasoned executive, but Xander lost their head, um, which, you know, this doesn't seem great. I think Lara's points were, were right on. It's still so early for them. You know, we, we, we did cover the Netflix earnings and, you know, the commentary around the CFO saying it's just, you know, it's like a million or so users or a million and a half users on this ad supported tier. It's just too early to even sort of consider this stuff. But I would imagine that there is a combination of partnerships, you know, that are that are demand side facing 
and um, you know a strong in-house effort that you know once they're ready to open up the floodgates, so to speak, kick this thing off, and it's going to be an absolute monster. I do hear a lot about Xander. That said, just in yep. like you know the ad tech ecosystem and companies like building on and and using like the tech is prolific. The company is is prolific for for sure. I mean, you know, true true to the DNA. Yeah, yeah. I think the market could use a little guidance as to where they're headed because their strategic direction changed a couple of times through AT and T, and then and now at Microsoft. And I think uh, folks aren't hearing from them enough. So um, with that, I think we're going to call it an episode. So this was a great conversation, a lot of news, a lot of exciting, interesting stuff. I, I, I suspect there's more to come from Lara uh, in the coming days, so I'm excited about that. So Lara, thank you so much for being here. No, thank you. This is really fun. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Eric. Eric, always a pleasure. Always. Thank you for subscribing to Marketecture. New interviews are added every week at Marketecture.tv and your favorite podcasting app. 